Greetings, brothers and sisters. Danica Patrick says her next romantic partner is going to be extremely high quality person. So this is a um, follow up video. Remember, I'll play a little clip from my um, previous coverage of this subject where she said something just platinum hilarious. <laughs> I mean, you get to meet you now and learn what you want now. And then it's OK if that doesn't stay the same. Right? So right now, we all know, like, I didn't know anything about um, Danica Patrick. I now know she spent a lot of time in Hollywood and California. <laughs> because that was California New Age speak right there. You get to meet yourself. You get to meet you now. Discover you now. Right? Like, I'm getting more to me. Like, I'm figuring right. out, like, dude... The next guy has his work cut out for him because my intuition, my standards, my boundaries, my wants and right. needs are like off the charts. Like, cause I've gotten to know me so much more. So <laughs> that was priceless. Let's break that down. This is great, right? This is just classic California feminism, feminism. New Age stuff. <laughs> and so uh, this is wonderful. Let's just go through this here. Right? Like I'm getting more to me. I She's getting more to me. She's getting more me. She needs more me in her life, right? She hasn't had enough me in her life. And now she's getting down. You know, she's gone on this Egypt trip. I don't know when this took place, but <laughs> before or after the Egypt trip. But she's finding me. You got to look for me. Where's me? She hasn't had enough me in her life. But this is the platinum line right here. Like I'm figuring out like, dude, the next guy has his work cut out for him because my. <laughs> Alex, I'll take I'll take sentences that'll make a man run away as fast as he can for 500. <laughs> Let's listen to that again, because that's great. Figuring out like, dude. The next guy has his work cut out for him because my intuition. He's got his work cut out for him. Like, so tell me, Danica, why are you still single? <laughs> There's this. This is great right here. My standards, my boundaries, my wants and right. needs are like off the charts. Like, because I've gotten to know me so much more. So it's going to be so much more narrow and specific. Right. So the guy comes to her front door on a uh, first date and she opens the door. She goes, look, mister, look there, buddy, Busta. <laughs> you got your work cut out for you. <laughs> you got your work cut out for you. Know, I'm famous. I'm a race car driver. I'm famous. And I've been working about me. I've been working on me. I'm getting to know me, my expectations. My boundaries, my wants and needs, my desires, my everything is off the charts. And you're expected to meet all those things. And so here she is on a show called Tamara Hall. And she's going to be asked a question about this. Well, you talk about dating in the future and you said the next guy who wants to be in a relationship with me will have his work cut out for him. <laughs> but hearing you, I'm thinking, what does she mean he's going to have his work cut? He's got a, a, a person, a partner who is self-reflective, who's looking at the inner, who's found her perfectly imperfect journey. And it. Wow. <laughs> There's a lot there. First of all, she misunderstood what she was saying. Because what Dana Kirkpatrick was saying there was that the person was going to have to work hard to keep up with her and be on her level, and she was going to be very demanding of the next guy. It wasn't that the guy would have a lot of work to cut out for him because she sucks. She wasn't saying that because I wouldn't have a video on it. <laughs> what was funny about it, she's saying that the next guy's going to have to, you know, he's going to have to measure up, right? <laughs> but her Tamara Hall saying that um, someone who's inner and self-reflective, which is something that I say, you know, all the time in terms of the heartfulness meditation, Look inside, be self-reflective. I'm all for those things. But these celebrities aren't like that. They pretend to be like that or they, you know, they look inside a little bit. Or they think they're like spiritual masters, right? Because they because they have a couple of self-reflective thoughts. And a partner who is self-reflective, who's looking at the inner, 
who's found her perfectly imperfect journey, and it is an awesome one. So how is he going to have his work cut out for him? Because you seem perfect, <laughs> perfectly imperfect to me. <laughs> yeah, so what? Everyone was perfectly imperfect, right? <laughs> then every relationship should be great. As long as you have to be perfectly imperfect, I'm perfectly imperfect. Like, what? <laughs> And again, this idea that people think that, you know, these celebrities think that they have some, you know, they go on some spiritual excursions, but it's not because they want to be spiritual or they're looking to have some internal journey. It's they're looking to make their lives better. I've talked about this with Oprah New Age Spirituality. It's about how to improve your life. Use your spiritual energy and you do these New Age spiritual things in ways to make your life and yourself better and to talk about these things at dinner parties and, you know, post about them and insta -ghoul about them and talk about how you're going on and these spiritual journeys and, you know, all the epiphanies that you're having and things like this. But it's all fake, right? It's external. You're not doing it to enhance your internal universe and your soul's journey and your subtle bodies and things like this. You're doing it to bolster your ego. It's all ego satisfaction stuff, right? That's why they talk about it egotistically, like all the things that she said. You know, in that other video, I talked about how she went to Egypt and she claimed to have all these spiritual epiphanies. And she comes back and talks about how she worked on her, I worked on me, 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 right? There's no me in spirituality. It's something where you're now living your material life so that you can further your spiritual journey, that your soul can move forward. Because what you're doing here, right, what you're doing on planet Earth is what your soul and God want you to do. You're sacrificing and you're going through difficult situations in a, you know, a spiritual way with gratitude and these things. You're learning about God's manifestation and God's ways through your physical experience, but it's spiritual knowledge. So one is that you sacrifice spiritually to benefit yourself and your ego now which is, you know, what they're talking about. What I talk about here is you sacrifice your material life, your egotistical life, your life as a, you know, enjoying, indulging person so that you can benefit spiritually. One's eternal and the other is temporary and fake, right? In this Hollywood, you know, new age language, like they think they're spiritual, but really it's just another way to bolster their egos and, their diva-like personalities. Yeah, again, like as time goes on, you can kind of clean the words up. And I think really what I mean is that I have, when you know what you don't want, you know what you do want. And so... Again, bumper stickers. <laughs> okay, I know what I don't want, so then therefore I know what I want. Like, <laughs> No, because there's infinite amount of things that are wrong, right? <laughs> You understand this? I've talked about this in terms of the spiritual path. There's one right path. There's one godly choice in every situation. It's very simple. But finding that choice in a, a sea of infinite wrong choices is difficult. The same thing with relationships. You can go into relationships and go, all right, I want to have as many bad relationships as I possibly can just so I can learn what I don't want, right? <laughs> That's just not the way to go about it. You're not going about, oh, I've had all these failures, so I'm, I'm bound to be successful. No, like you have a pattern of failure, right? <laughs> if you keep on losing, you're, you're, you're training yourself how to lose, right? You're training yourself how to make mistakes and do the wrong thing. And so a person who has done it right from the beginning is a lot better off. I mean, that's, you know, how it should be. So that would be like for anybody yeah. who likes to watch videos about anything kind of spiritual, Abraham Hicks says that all the time. So you can look up YouTube videos on that. Um, but you know, you, you know, you know what you don't, you, what you don't want. So you know what you do. And so maybe it's not necessarily that they their work cut out for them, but that they're going to be an extremely high quality, like person with a lot of boxes to check. And it's not as though there's yeah. boxes to check. Yeah. But you just said boxes to check. They're going to be an extremely high quality person. How do you know that? Like, what are you doing? to draw to you a high quality person. And they have a lot of boxes to check, but they're not really boxes to check. <laughs> like you're gonna, if there was like a line on your successful future 
romantic situations. Like if Las Vegas had a betting line, <laughs> I would take that bet that it's not going to work out the way that you think it's going to work out. Him, but that they're going to be an extremely high quality like person with a lot of boxes to check. And it's not as though there's yeah. boxes to check. It's just that I know what I want now. Um, and I'm not willing to compromise bend um, as much. Right. And so. Exactly. Nothing helps out a romantic relationship like not being able to bend. <laughs> not being as flexible, being very rigid about what you expect, what you want from a person, that that person has to be what you want. And so she's going to get a high quality person. She just knows it. She knows what she doesn't want. She knows she has a lot of boxes to check, but they're, you know, not really boxes. And she's not going to be at all flexible. It already sounds like a recipe for success. So, um, but there's also this meeting on the other side of going, once I have healed and I have processed and I have accepted the imperfections that exist within me, I now give permission for the other person to be imperfect. And I also don't see yeah. their flaws as much because it's like, say. So the person doesn't have a lot of work cut out for them and they don't have to be a high quality person and they don't have to check a lot of boxes because you're just not going to see their imperfections. Like she's got it all. Like <laughs> It's an enigma. Hey, you know, like I always use this reference because it's mine. If someone's lazy, I judge that, right? Because I don't allow myself to be lazy. So now if I can create a healthy yeah. dynamic within myself of maybe reframing it and doing it more, which is resting. Now, if someone's resting, it used to be called lazy, but I'm not triggered anymore. And so <laughs> oh, wow, you're quite a catch. He's that lazy. He's He's, he's just rested. <laughs> this is, I hope that she keeps on doing interviews about this. I hope this continues because it's great. <laughs> She's reframing it. It's not lazy. He's, he's resting. And so what would she used to do if the person was lazy? So the person oh, that's wow. across from me is not seen in such a judgmental light anymore or because yeah, I'm not yeah. judging myself. Um, exactly. She's not judging herself. She's not calling herself lazy. She's just resting. Therefore, this, you know, guy who's laying on the couch playing video games for a month, <laughs> he's just resting. Um, so, you know, as you heal, you also are able to coexist with people in a much more, um, a much easier way. Kablam, she's got it all figured out, right? She needs a high quality person who's working as much in themselves as she's working on her. She's worked on herself and she needs all that. But if he isn't like that, well, she's healed herself and is forgiving herself and isn't judging herself because it's all about her. <laughs> and therefore she won't judge him because she'll be reframing everything. If he's lazy, kablam, he's not lazy, he's just resting because she's not lazy, she's just resting, right? <laughs> I mean, the level of self-involvement here. But the bigger piece of this thing is that within a spiritual journey, your relationships oftentimes have value to you in the sense of pointing out what you have to work on because it's not like some chess checklist right where you you know you're that's like stefford wives stuff right she's talking about those old stefford wives move movies where these guys would have these you know robotic women or westworld or whatever it is and they would program what they wanted into these you know these non-sovereign non-spiritual non-soul bearing robots or whatever they were and so that's just the female version of that. And women have always done that just as much as men, even more so. But that's not what you get because you really can't help the people that you love. And there's a plan. There's a soul plan. And you have past lives with people. And there's a pre-life plan. Before you come down, your life is already planned out and your relationships and things are planned out. And so, you know, you're going to love people that may not seem good for you or may seem you know, bad for you. And sometimes they are, at least on the material level, but there's spiritual benefit in all of these relationships, crappy relationships, whatever they are, there's spiritual benefits for you, for everyone. And that's why you don't get to pick, right? Just like playing sports or, you know, 
you have a game plan and you go into the game and you want to perform well and you want to, I mean, she's a race car driver. I don't think how many races did she win, right? You can't control that stuff. I mean, it's, you know, some of it has to do with hard work or whatever it might be. If it's not rigged or fixed, if you're competing in some way, some days you come out and just have a lousy game, a lousy day. I mean, everybody plans their life and then human beings make plans and God laughs, right? <laughs> and so it's just stupid to think that way. It's just, you know, going about it with some gratitude and realizing that the people that you keep on being with who are, are all sharing the same sort of um, qualities, things that you don't like, things that bother you, maybe it's time to realize that you're drawing those people by what you have inside of you, right? That you have to change internally, not in some psychological way where there's self-forgiveness. There has to be spiritual cleaning. And that's, you know, there's the heart from the system. There's the cleaning of the heart and some scars, you know, these impressions that you bring in with you before you're born and things like this. You're carrying over from previous existences, whatever they might be, or your soul's plan. You can either clean those things off or just accept them and be grateful for what you get because it's somehow benefiting you and bringing you closer to God. And so that's, you know, the true perfect imperfection that there's reasons for everything that's happening. There's a plan and you just have to learn to be grateful for it. But that's not how these Hollywood people roll. <laughs> and so their new age, you know, philosophies is that somehow you can will and manifest the world that you want and the life that you want, and that's not possible. That's why they're always miserable, because they're trying to use spiritual principles to create some sort of magical fairy tale type life that doesn't exist for them or anywhere else, anybody else. All right, with that, let's move on to Alec Baldwin. So we haven't checked on this great actor, Alec Baldwin. Here he is. Here he is with his newborn uh, surrogate child. And he's, he's not being lazy. He's resting. He's not lazy. He's resting, right? He's perfectly imperfect. Him and his baby, his baby, Hilaria Baldwin, taking these pictures down here. You know, this uh, Wonder Woman from Boston, Spain. And this baby, this um, baby they just had, they're two babies in a row, a baby that she gave birth to and a surrogate baby and a couple of resters. Don't dare you, don't you dare call them lazy. You got to confront what's going on with yourself. You're judging yourself. That's what's happening and calling them lazy when they're clearly just resting. And then these guys, two great actors, Kevin Bacon and Alec Baldwin. There's just too much talent. <laughs> For this photograph. <laughs> this is wonderful. What do you got going on here? This is, um, hey, here's something. This could be good. Okay. Every day in. The U.S., every day in the U.S. is an, another, I, I jumped a gun there, another opportunity. It's another opportunity. Every day in the, the U.S. is another opportunity to be canceled. <laughs> Every day in the U.S. is another opportunity to be canceled. <laughs> You're not letting this thing go with your wife in the Boston, Spain thing. This is great. He's got um, Amanda Knox navigates labyrinths. She's a labyrinth navigator. I tried very, very hard to be cheerful and to like have just like this positive moment with my family members because those moments were precious, right? I don't want to upset my dad. I'm here wrongfully convicted of murder, <laughs> facing a 26-year sentence in an Italian prison. But, you know, I really, really don't want to upset dad. I don't want to upset dad because it's like... They're pals for some reason. Here we go. This is what we're looking for. This is classic Alec here. What's he going on here? He's got the thing. His hands on his lips, what does he got? <clears throat> you 
you know, he does this every time. Like, there's this thing called a mirror, and you could actually do your hair before you get on camera. I mean, I shouldn't have to say this because you're an actor. I accept that you're perfectly imperfect, but you might want to just, you know, work on your hair before you go live on Instagool. I got that Hampton hair. Yeah, you do. <laughs> um. You know, he's had such a tough life. These, you know, Hampton, the Hampton area is, I guess, in New York. It's where um, Chris Cuomo has a beach house. All these people have beach houses out there, right? It's a very wealthy area, nice beaches, and, you know, and it's close to New York City, close enough where people can commute or they, you know, they have these Hampton houses, and he's got one. Oh, and today. Um, I just wanted to say that I was sorry to read that Norton Juster died. Um, okay, I better move forward because, you know, can't be laughing at that. So <laughs> let's find something better here. What has he got? That book. And Norton Juster, who wrote the book, he passed away recently. So I just wanted to say, rest in peace, Norton Juster. Um, and uh, what else? Well, you just, you know, gave a tribute to this great author. What else? What else could you think of, Alec? You know, you're on Instagram, you're live. People are waiting for some compelling anti-Trump rhetoric. What do you got there, buddy? What's your second act here, buddy? Kablawi, there it is. Jumbo cashews. They don't eat ordinary cashews at the... Baldwin residents, they have jumbo cashews. He eats them. He likes the jumbo cashews. He's got jumbo cashews. Having some cashews. We eat a lot of nuts around here. <laughs> yeah, you do. Jumbo style. <laughs> We have six kids now. Wait, how many kids? We have six kids now. And thank you for all the good wishes from people who said something to us about the kids. We have six kids now. Wait, is it six kids you have? How many kids is it? Um, I laugh. I don't complain about it. And my heart goes out to everybody, obviously, that's struggling. My wife and I have tried to do to retool our philanthropy this year to focus on people in need for basics, food, clothing, books, internet. How you exactly, just the basics. Food, clothing, books, internet, jumbo cashews, all the basics. All the basics for you people out there. Our, phil our philanthropy, we're retooling it. To get through the lockdown, you know. Um, but, um, I mean, I don't, I mean, part of me doesn't mind but I grew up with so little that I sit here and I think about the grocery bills in this house. I'm like, oh my God, the grocery bills here are, they're insane. Insane grocery bills. You know why? Because you like the jumbo cashews. Maybe have some regular cashews for a change. Maybe have some regular cashews for a change. You're perfectly imperfect. They're insane. But the kids eat, eat healthy. My wife is very, um, she enforces that very well. They get their treats, they get their sweets, but they got to eat their healthy dinner. And boy, they, have, they, they eat well. They, they eat a healthy meal. These kids have got a real healthy situation here, so it's great. A lot of health, a lot of health in this house. You know, I thought he was going to suck after Trump left. We no longer had these Trump rants. But he's brought this compelling stuff about Jumbo cashews and Hampton hair. It's wonderful. But, um, um, they eat a lot of cashews. They eat a lot of. You know, it's, it's live action. He's showing you, he's demonstrating eating cashews. You know, it's just not talking. There's eating of cashews here as well. Peanuts, nuts. But thank you for your good wishes about Lucia. Marilu, Lulu. I have another one. 
um, there are people who say, oh, you know, why do you want to bring so many kids into this world? And it's irresponsible environmentally. And I'm like, okay, noted. He's, he's noting, he's noting your complaint. Noted. Thank you. Thank you for caring. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Have a jumbo capture. Get the F out of here. <laughs> here. Take a... <laughs> He's going to throw some jumbo cashews at you. <laughs> I, can, I can throw some jumbo, <laughs> jumbo cashews at you. I can't do the whisper. He's just a rare gem, this guy. And then we just thought about, you know, what do we want to do? What is the will of God? So forth. So anyway, but thank you for um, for casting your vote. <laughs> Alec is rocking it. Alec is just, you know, he's struggling with the post-Trump era, but he's, he's trying to, he's trying to, you know, put some quality content out here, doing the will of God and all. In terms of the number of children we should have. Have a lovely day. You do. You do have a lovely day. That was platinum. Just wonderful. Uh, just, you know, that was five star, Alec. Way to go. Way, way to bring it. So I want to segue back into the royal family because I've, in the past, I don't know, a couple weeks since all this stuff happened with the, um, you know, the Markles. <laughs> and then... um watching the crown show which turned out to be a great show on lots of levels lots of truth you know hidden truth coming out they're doing it in a sort of sly way but i had this um revelation because i talked about how the queen owns one-sixth of the world's land but i you know dug a little deeper i have that coming up what that really means some of the bizarre things that she claims that the throne claims to own and it'll put a perspective on you know the centerpiece of how effed up our world is so let's start here with this um with the show the crown episode um from season four to episode towards the end of the season four like episode seven i think it is i'll show you a little clip from that because it's important to understand this idea of bloodlines and the this is from the crown and understanding bloodlines there's narissa and Catherine. Bo's Lion, and they are first cousins to Queen Elizabeth and Princess Margaret, and it was revealed that despite a 1963 edition of Burke's Pernage listing, Nerissa, these are, you know, this is something to do with the, um, the heredity of the royal kingdom, Nerissa and Catherine has having died in 1940 and 1961, respectively, the sisters were alive and had been placed in Earlswood Hospital for Mentally Disabled in 1941 and were classified as imbeciles. And they lived to 2014. They were hidden away for bloodline reasons. So this is the end of the episode. And they show that these kids have been hidden away because of their bloodlines to protect the reputation of the bloodline. I'll get into that. I'll show you more of the clip. But they were basically mentally handicapped, couldn't speak. One of them lived to 2014, the other one to 1986. And there was, I believe, three to five other of these, you know, children that had these handicaps, probably to do with the marrying of cousins, right? This inbreeding that they do in the royal family level. And so they pretended these guys were dead. They pretended these handicapped girls were dead they put them in this um you know the lineage but it turns out that they were just hiding them away and the show does a good job here of explaining it they're professionally diagnosed idiocy and imbecility well who is it right <laughs> i think we pretty much could give that a, a, a blanket diagnosis on humanity would make people question the integrity of the bloodline what? So this is the queen's mother, the older woman, and the queen's sister, Princess Margaret, in the show The Crown. And they're having a conversation. Princess Margaret just found out she has cousins, people that 
are, you know, would be close to her that were disappeared and put in an asylum and nobody knows about it. And she found a book where it says that they're dead, right? And now there's this question about the bloodline being impure. Can you imagine the headlines if it were to get out? What people would say. The hereditary principle already hangs by such a precarious thread. Throw in mental illness and it's over. So the show does a great job. I mean, I when I, you know, heard about the show, I always thought it was going to be one of these, you know, ass kissing, you know, royal family ass kissing type of show promoting, you know, the queen and all this stuff, the the monarchy, but it's far from that. The characters are portrayed as narcissistic and entitled and, you know, evil in many ways. The queen who was sort of the hero or the protagonist in the beginning of the show becomes, you know, a gatekeeper herself where she is being told what to do and they're managing and handling her. And then as time goes on, she's doing the same things to her family members. And so it's a great show in that way. And what her mom is saying in this, you know, in this fictional depiction, which doesn't appear to be fictional, is that the reason they hid the girls away, which is really the the most logical explanation, is if it got out that there was these, you know, mentally impaired girls in the royal family bloodline directly related to the queen, and then, you know, these other three children, then they wouldn't have a claim that their genetics made them royal, you know, which is so messed up. It's beyond, you know, it's just your genetics don't make you have the ability to lead, at least in terms of a genetic line. And they're horrible leaders. They're thugs and they just get more and more entitled and things like this. And so um, she's making the case here that they had to do this or it would be over. People would say, hey, these guys aren't royal. Look at their, you know, look at these girls, right? Their genetics aren't better than ours. <laughs> it's so messed up. The idea that one family alone has the automatic birthright to the crown is already so hard to justify. The gene pool of that family had better have 100% purity. So they had to pretend these girls were dead and lock them away in an institution. You see, it makes total sense, right? I mean, think about, you know, and this is one of many horrible things the royal family has done, not only to themselves, their own family, but the world, to somehow keep their, their power, their line going. There have been enough examples on the Windsor side alone to worry people. King George III... Prince John, your uncle. If you add the Bowes Lion illnesses to that, the danger is it becomes untenable. And this thing is that it, you know, let nature take its course. Power isn't supposed to be passed on from generation to generation in a bloodline because we see what happens. The royal family becomes more and more entitled, they're clueless to what it's like to live normal lives. You're not supposed to hoard wealth generationally where these kids are growing up in opulence and they don't have any perspective of what it takes to lead because they don't really understand what's going on with normal people and normal lives. And they just get crazier and crazier. They get more deviant and they get more, you know, just selfish and entitled and huge egos. The show does a great job of displaying all of this. But it is a sovereign's duty when they are part of the Commonwealth. But I would argue that the Commonwealth is not the way to fill that gap. Not through association with unreliable tribal leaders in eccentric costumes. But isn't that all I am, Prime Minister? That's exactly what you are. So that's the Queen and Margaret Thatcher played by Gilligan Anderson. Remember I did a video about that and that old thing with Alec Baldwin that was wonderful as well. And so this is to do with apartheid in South Africa, which I forgot about. Another example of where the British have done horrible things throughout the world and left a mess. And she is, you know, just this tribal queen wearing elaborate costumes with these outdated, ridiculous rituals. 
but the power and hold they have over everybody is significant. And so there's another scene from this episode I want to show here. You can't say I didn't warn you. <laughs> the guy on the right is the Queen's personal secretary, and the guy on the left was her sort of media advisor. And the Queen, who has made it clear that she wants to do nothing, she never does anything but back the prime minister and the government. She doesn't give her opinion on issues and things like this. She just stays neutral, not to upset any of the people, you know, any of her subjects, just to keep them, you know, thinking that she agrees with them or whatever. But she ends up going against Thatcher on apartheid, and she leaks something. She has the guy on the left leak something, which he thinks is a horrible idea, but he does it anyway. And now they want him to fall on the sword and take the blame for it. You know, because it's all this gaslighting, greasy stuff here. And to see it uh, compromised like this, as a, a consequence of your actions. <laughs> what? <laughs> Fact is that the steps you took were completely unprofessional. But Martin, stop it. Impugning the integrity of the palace and of the queen herself. We know one another too well. So the queen went against this guy's advice and made a mistake, and it cost her some embarrassment. And now the guy who advised against it, and he said, I want this noted that I'm against it. <laughs> and then they're screwing him over and making him take the blame, even though he was ordered to do something he didn't believe in. This is madness. I hope we can rely on you to do the right thing. Of course. So I want to tie all this together, the stuff with um, the race car driver, <laughs> Alec Baldwin and the royal family here, and the celebrity culture and the royal culture, and just how people get devoured People get eaten up and spit out and all these things, chewed up and spit out and all these things to keep the power and the system going. Even sometimes the royals themselves. I mean, this is the families constantly devouring their own and all of them have to make incredible sacrifices and who they love or what they believe or what they're willing to do or what they have to do just to keep this royal family going. And it's obscene, right? It's just an abomination. But let's go back to this stuff about the queen's wealth. So to fully understand, uh, you know, I did a video about how, a couple of videos about how the queen owns 6.6 .6 billion acres worldwide. It's about 18% of the land, you know, three times six is 18, 6.6. .6. You see all these islands and stuff here to tell you which country they are, but there's all these little islands, Australia's here. Of course, India, this is all Pakistan, British Commonwealth countries, various countries in Africa, a number of countries in Africa, about 10 of them. And of course, the uh, Ireland and Scotland and Canada and some uh, countries here in South America and Central America and these Caribbean islands, these beautiful exotic islands here. So they own quite a bit, right? They have a lot going on here. These are all the countries, 52 countries. And so how does that translate into this 6.6 .6 billion acres? Well, my wife was saying that she had just found out that in Canada, you can't own land. You can lease it from the queen. <laughs> the queen can not only shut down parliament in Canada, but it says here only 9%, 9.7% of the total land is privately owned while the rest is crown land. So the crown, the queen, the queen, the crown owns 90% of the land in Canada. It says here, the queen continues to legally own all the lands of Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and 32 other members around the two, around two thirds of the Commonwealth in Antarctica. The feudalism is not dead, it's just hiding. So you think about all these countries, right? The, you know, the British army invaded these countries and subjugated the people, and they started claiming land, right? Very small country. I mean, look at England compared to all these giant countries and these, you know, massive amount of land 
that they were able to invade and then colonize. And then years later, when these countries can now say, F you, get out of our country, like it's a totally different world, right? And there's the UN, there's all these, you know, various organizations, and there's various, you know, power elements. They're still allowing the queen to own them, right? <laughs> they're volunteering their, you know, their, their subjugation. They're allowing to be themselves to be subjugated. And you see from this article here, the inside the British monarchy's $13 billion empire, I guess that's, uh, is that euros, whatever the currency, but it's worth way more than that. It's one sixth of the, you know, some of the best land in the world. You know, this is worth trillions upon trillions of dollars. And they're covering up the amount of wealth that the British Empire still possesses. In Britain, the Land Act of 1925 allegedly gave British subjects the right to two kinds of ownership, freehold and leasehold. Freehold is described in the Land Registry Act of 2002 as an interest in a state in land fee simple. Leasehold is similarly an interest in a state land and fee and simple for a term of years. Fee simple is the important phrase here. It's a medieval phrase which puts limitations on ownership in the form of taxation, police power, eminent domain, and east cheat. So eminent domain, well, all of these things, they get to tax you. So they're taxing. You are renting the land from you from them, which they're receiving money for. And then they get to tax you on the land itself. And police can come in and do whatever they want, right? Because they're, you know, law enforcement. And then eminent domain, which means that they can come and take the land back anytime they want. And so you think you own the land, right? But the land is still owned by the queen. So let's put this in proper perspective. Give some perspective to this. 39 surprising things Queen Elizabeth owns. All the swans on the Thames River. So you have this river that runs through London, big river. And all the swans, she owns them. If there's swans on the on the river, they're hers. A pair of dorgies, well, she has these dogs. All the dolphins in the United Kingdom. <laughs> and so you can't own dolphins. <laughs> you know, think about what that's saying here. All the dolphins in the United Kingdom. And so here it says... Much like the aforementioned swans, the queen's got a solid claim on many of the country's aquatic creatures. A statute from 1324, which originated during the reign of King Edward, stated, The king shall have wreck of the sea throughout the realm, whales and sturgeons taken in in the sea or elsewhere within the realm, except in certain places privileged by the king. The law still stands today. And covers not just whales and sturgeons, but dolphins and porpoises too, when they're captured within three miles of the UK. They own it all. They own all the fish within a three mile radius, you know, along the coastline. Nearly all of London's Regent Street, half of UK's shoreline. So you have this, you know, land, ocean land, coastline land is just the most valuable, especially in a place like, you know, European coastline, which is limited, very small countries, and she owns half of it. Half of the prime land belongs to the queen along the coast, six royal residences, we know about the castles, more than 2,000 lawn or handbags, a private ATM, the best seat at the House of Wimbledon, the Tower of London, you know, more castles, 150,000 works of art, many of them priceless. 150,000 works of art. <laughs> you know, this is um, Queen Victoria's sketchbook. I'm not sure what that is. A winning team of racehorses. A car collection worth more than $10 million. A tiara covered with 1,333 diamonds. A massive collection of Fabergé eggs. Westminster Abbey, I think she owns a couple of churches. Hyde Park, a gold record. 
She owns a bat colony. You know, <laughs> they just belong to her. The world's largest clear-cut diamond, an offshore wind farm, the UK's continental shelf. So that's again more of the ocean. She owns a lot of the ocean. All of Scotland's gold mines. 25,000 acres of forest, millions of square feet of retail space, and a baptismal font. She owns her own font, a national collection of mulberries. So this kind of puts things in perspective. I mean, these are just some of the stuff that she owns, right? Like, it's obscene. This information now that's coming out about the royal family, at least in terms of, you know, I made videos about this for years but really didn't understand or see or have all the information or, you know, wasn't time or whatever. But in terms of this video, it's very clear that the royal family's essence, the, you know, the quintess quintessential essence is to keep power. That's all they care about. And nothing else matters. If they had to destroy the world to keep power, of course, you know, then that wouldn't be possible. They would do it. There's nothing that they won't do to keep their line in power. And that's devouring their own, devouring countries, devouring whatever it takes. Whoever has to fall on their sword, whatever it is, they're willing to do it. There was a time where monarchies were ending all over Europe and the world. There was a time where people rising up and realizing they didn't need these parasites. In fact, these parasites were parasites, right? And so all these monarchies all these kingdoms that were there all over Europe and various parts of the world started to fall. The end of kingdoms, right? The end of monarchies, these bloodlines. And somehow the British royal family survived when it should have gone, like it should have, it should have disappeared with the rest of them. There was ample opportunities. They made mistake after mistake, scandal after scandal, but they were just able to stay alive somehow. They have this centralized power based in colonialism. You know, there was a divine reason for monarchies and the exploration of the world. And, and what became colonialism was that the divine forces, the, you know, the beings that oversee this planet, wanted the various cultures around the world connected. Like that had to happen. There was benefit to that. There was the best optimal outcome, which is all of these cultures around the world, all these different types of people and places around the world would share what was best in each one of them, right? Each one of these cultures having something to offer the collective and there would be connectivity and like intermarrying and things like this. And you would have like the best of humanity expressed. That was best case scenario. And these, you know, European cultures, these explorers and people that had ambition, they were doing God's work by bringing that all together, that possibility of bringing about what is best. America is another example of that. We have people from all over the world coming to a centralized location where the best of what humanity had to offer could be expressed. But just the opposite happened. You had these people who saw an opportunity to colonize and subjugate the people, take their land, take their resources, use them as, you know, slave labor or whatever it was, and to expand their wealth and dominance over the world, right, and their lifestyle and all these things, and then build it into some intergenerational bloodline type of situation instead of just letting it go, right? You served your purpose, you brought about the connectivity of the world, they brought the world together, and now they, you know, they didn't need to exist anymore. They had served their purpose. It wasn't part of the divine plan to pass on this wealth and power that they had gotten through violence and ill-gotten gains, right, through, through superior military technology. So they weren't, you know, God, the, the plan wasn't for them to pass on this wealth to their inbred kids, their deviant inbred kids, and keep the thing going. After they served their purpose, they, you know, they started to disappear. These kingdoms fell apart of their own deviance, their own, you know, selfishness and greed and misreading the masses, the 
people their subjects and pissing off their subjects and the mob rule came about and destroyed these kingdoms one by one except the British monarchy somehow survived and you can see they just keep on doing stupid stuff they're selfish they they're all power hungry they you know they're they're a bad family it's a very dysfunctional family and yet there's a power structure around them that keeps it going right where people have been sold this fairy tale royal you know whatever it is marriages and this idea of marrying a prince and all these things i mean look at what happened to diana and now megan markles and all these you know these women live in the so-called dream right <laughs> but yet they keep on going and their sole purpose to, is to keep the power line intact keep the power going keep this vortex of power and money and wealth and all these things together and it needs to be distributed right it's time for it to end it's like in the second matrix movie where smith character is explaining to neo that when neo killed him he knew what he was supposed to do in the matrix he's this you know computer program that he was supposed to just die he was supposed to disappear and he refused to do it right <laughs> he refused to do what was supposed to happen and that's what the royal family has done the, you know it's not just the family itself because they're just the front you know the front men the, they're just the they're just the presentation for the public but this vortex of power that should have you know been destroyed years ago that's sucking up resources and stopping change from happening and then there's all these other various corporate organizations and other organizations that are learning how to retain power and stay alive long after your expiration date your time you know your time on this planet was up and you keep on going even though it's you know against the divine forces so inevitably they'll be you know disappeared and for humanity to move forward they have to be disappeared right this is you know colonialism and royalty and these you know monarchical monarchical bloodlines and all this stuff has to be disappeared right they can't you know it doesn't work it's bad you know it's bad for the family of themselves and then you know worse for everybody else it stops the energy from flowing there isn't supposed to be intergenerational wealth like this right wealth and power it's supposed to be you know absorbed back into the whole you're only supposed to hold power for a short period of time power like everything else money and power and all these things are meant to flow they're not supposed to be you know held on to through a series of generations right because it always gets worse and worse same thing for religions and all these things it's supposed to flow right and then when when something's supposed to end it ends and something new takes its place but they've found a way and i've talked about this even in my book the choice they found a way to keep the deception and illusions going and retain power long after they should have given it back to bring this back to danica patrick and to alec baldwin and celebrity worship and the worship of mahatmas you know great people certainly the queen you know the royal bloodline and humanity right now worships greatness this idea of greatness and i i think that greatness is actually a negative word because greatness implies something to do with the ego right america's great you're great you know this person's great that person's great it means they've achieved something in some field of activity in an egotistical way, in a diva type way. You know, people say God is great, and that's not an accurate description of God because God's in everything, right? Love is in everything. God's energy, divine essence is in everything. And so God's beyond great. Like great is, you know, kind of an insult to God. And the way that people become great is that they achieve something by spending all their life's energy and having a single focus on that thing, on that pursuit, on their craft or their art. So they become a great musician, a great athlete, a great actor or celebrity or whatever it is. People who achieve some high level in society spend most of their life energy achieving greatness. And then there's this false belief by the normal folks by the average folks, that these people are better than them because they're great at one thing. But the only reason they're great at one thing is, is specialization 
and spending all their energy and time and effort and work at achieving something in a specialized field. But in the other aspects of their life, they suck, right? They're horrible parents, they're horrible at this and that, right? They're not balanced, right? They don't have a lot of different things that they can do. They can do one thing. And people say, well, if they're great at that, they're going to be great at this too, right? <laughs> if they're good at this, they got to be great at this as well. They're great at one thing, they got to be great at something else because they have greatness in them. And so, yeah, they have talent or charisma, and the royal family spends all of their energy trying to hold on to their wealth and power. And, you know, if that land and everything got divided up, it, it would be other people, singular people, groups of people, conglomerates taking the land. It wouldn't be distributed among the people. Like, that's not how our system works. It's about individual greatness. It's about individual, individual standing above, you know, being in the capstone of the pyramid and being better than other people. And these people are all unbalanced because they spend all their time, all their energy at being great and, you know, being seen as great and feeding off the, the energy from the crowd, from the masses. But there's huge areas in their lives, you know, important areas, spirituality, their connection to God, their connection to their family and children, and just other, you know, basic life skills and things that they don't possess because they spend all their energy in doing one thing, the specialization that has killed humanity, right? It's one of the destructive aspects where everyone's specialized in one job. You know, they have one job that they do and a specialized skill where people in the past, I mean, it was one of the things I learned from homesteading and how many different skills you needed to be a farmer. People look down at farmers, but farmers had to do so many things and wear so many hats. You know, it's one of the great things about the Heartfulness Meditation that says you need two wings, the, the bird needs two wings to fly, a material wing and a spiritual wing. Because in the field of spirituality, there's been many higher developed spiritual beings, saints that came down to planet Earth and they meditated and prayed for 18 hours a day and they didn't do anything else, right? They were, you know, a, a drag on society. They didn't contribute anything materially and they were out of balance. Whereas nowadays, most people are completely focused on their material lives and not balancing that with a spiritual life where you can just be good enough at so many things. You don't have to be great at anything, but you can be good at lots of things and a contributing member. And most of all, working on your character and your spiritual path. You know, the Heartfulness Meditation is a system where with about an hour and a half of spiritual practice a day, so you spend the rest of your waking hours on your material pursuits and your material lives. And if you give an hour and a half, an hour and 45 minutes a day on your spiritual life, you can achieve, you know, wonderful spiritual evolution and connect to God in a deep level while still maintaining your material lives and your material duties. And so you see that that's why we're out of balance. And these people that are put on a pedestal, whether they be athletes or celebrities or politicians or even just wealthy people, billionaires, people who are great at things, are, are celebrated and worshipped. And really, they're you know underdeveloped people that have focused so much on one egotistical pursuit because they wanted to be special. They wanted to stand up above the crowd, and then they're worshipped. And that's one of the downfalls of our system. Only spirituality will save this world. It's Paul Romano, definitely reporting from the Apocalypse and the Ascension. Everyone have a blessed day and be grateful.